Constructing routines of MO and EOA. So the next important concept in Unit 2 is constructing routines of a memorandum of association and article of association. So what do you mean by constructing notice? The doctrine. Since both MOA and AOA are public documents, the person entering into contract is presumed to know them. So since this both MOA and AOA are registered with the registrar, then they are made public. Then these documents are made public. So any outsider who is entering into contract with the company, for example, if he is buying shares or entering into any kind of contract with the company, is presumed that he has read the MOA and AOA of that company. So this is called constructive notice. Case law. Kotla Venkata Swami vs. Chinta Ramamurthy. So the AOA of the company read that deeds to be signed by a managing director, secretary, and working director. But the plaintiff accepted a deed by a mortgage executed by secretary and working director only. So he didn't take signature of the managing director. The court held that this contract was not binding with the company since the plaintiff did not take managing director signature which was mentioned in the article of association and the plaintiff is presumed to know that he has read article of association since it, uh, it was assumed that he had got constructive notice. So this constructive notice is really important and uh, to understand the next concept doctrine of indoor management. So this is in the syllabus doctrine of indoor management. So what is this doctrine of indoor management? See the constructive notice is there to protect the company from the outsiders but the doctrine of indoor management is totally opposite. It is there to protect the you know, outsider from the company's frauds. So what is this doctrine? If directors have authority to bind the company but certain preliminaries are required before exercising that power, then person contracting is not bound to see that preliminaries are absurd. It is presumed that the company has or the director has already performed all the obligations. So the doctrine says that if a director can enter into a contract but he has to do certain obligations or preliminaries in the company, he has to perform certain office tasks, only then he can exercise that power. Then the outsider can presume that he has performed that task and after that only he is exercising his power. So this is doctrine of indoor management. So the reasons for this, firstly, outsiders don't have access to company's internal affairs. So the director has to perform internal tasks in the company and the outsider cannot go into company and uh, into or, or he is and has not having permission to get inside the office of the company. So he cannot see that if the director has to fulfill that condition or not. So that's why in the doctrine of internal management exists. Secondly, company may lie. So even if the director, the director has performed that obligation, so even though he has performed, he may lie to the outsider that he has not performed. So this is the reason for doctrine of indoor management. Case law, Royal British Bank vs. Turquoise. So the directors borrowed money from the plaintiff. So the plaintiff is entering into a contract. Directors borrowed money from the plaintiff. They are taking loan from the plaintiff. The article of association read of, of the company read that directors may borrow but with a special resolution passed in meeting. So the directors may borrow the uh, borrow a loan, but they have to pass a special resolution in the meeting. So, but no special resolution was passed. So they did not pass any special resolution, but they took loan from the plaintiff. So the company's board of directors uh, filed a suit that this loan is not binding on the company. But however, it was held that the company was uh, bind binded by the loan because of, uh, due, due to the doctrine of indoor management. So plaintiff has presumed that directors are uh, uh, directors have passed the special resolution. They have uh, performed the preliminaries. Exceptions to doctrine of indoor management. First is knowledge of irregularity. So if there is a knowledge of irregularity, that is both the parties know that there is a irregularity. So this can happen when among company members the contract has been going on. Within the insiders, if they are entering into a contract, then they will have all the knowledge of the company. So it does not attract a doctrine of indoor management. The next is a suspicion of irregularity. 
So this arises when someone lot of authority is entering into a contract. So for example, if an outsider go to a uh, accountant and uh, ask the accountant to transfer all the company property in his name, then it will not be valid. Because the accountant uh, obviously does not have authority to transfer a company's property to anyone. The next is forgery. So if someone, if an uh, authority does a fake signature from the company and uh, tries to enter into a contract, then also doctrine of internal management does not retract. The next is representation through articles. So delegation clause in uh, article, if the article is uh, delegating power to someone else, then also the doctrine of internal management does not attract. Acts outside apparent authority. So someone who is not of authority is entering into a contract, then also the company is not bending out with it. The next important concept is prospectus. So what is this prospectus? According to section 2 clause 70, it is defined as any document described or issued as a prospectus and include. So it is any document described or issued as a prospectus and includes a red herring prospectus under section 32, shelf prospectus under section 3, then any notice, circular or advertisement or other documents inviting offers from public for subscription and purchase of securities of a body corporate. So in simple words, prospectus is nothing but a kind of advertisement inviting people to buy their shares. So in prospectus, uh, they uh, include every detail of the company and they publish it so that the people can uh, see the prospectus and buy their shares. It is more of like an inviting people to buy their share or an advertisement. So types of prospectus. What are the types of prospectus? First, we have a red herring prospectus under section 32. So, red herring prospectus is offering securities to public. So, when it is made to public to buy their shares, then it is called a red herring prospectus. So, no mention of price or quantity. There is no mention of a price or quantity in the prospectus. They only say that we are selling securities. So, anyone who is interested can buy. So, this is called a red herring prospectus. It is filed with a registrar and must be same as a prospectus. So, later they have to create an original prospectus and this red herring prospectus should be same as that prospectus. The next is shelf prospectus under section 31. So, shelf prospectus offers securities for a specific period of time only. So, for a, specific, small, uh, for a specific period of time, if they are selling securities, then it is called shelf prospectus. So, maximum is one year. For a one year period of time or less than that, they can do shelf prospectus, sell securities. Then fresh prospectus is not necessary. This prospectus after the expiry of one year, this prospectus is again continued. The next is abridged prospectus. So abridged prospectus is a brief, is a prospectus in brief. So it contains only the salient features of the main prospectus. Only the important features of the main prospectus are attached in a abridged prospectus. And these uh, salient features are prescribed by SEBI, Security Exchange Board of India, by making regulations. The next is deemed prospectus. So this deemed prospectus is not made by the company, but instead it is an offer for sale of securities by an intermediary or on, be on behalf of the company. So an intermediary on behalf of the company may uh, offers a sale of securities to public. Then it is called deemed prospectus. So it is done to avoid regulations of SEBI. The next important concept is contents of a prospectus. This has been asked for 10 marks under section 26. So what are these contents of the prospectus? It must be signed and dated and contains the following documents. First, it should contain a name of the company. The next is a registered address of the company. It should contain content or prospectus should contain next is object and purpose of the company should be contained in a prospectus purpose of the issue of prospectus nature and capital structure of the business total capital of the business name location and the number of shares that signatories have subscribed qualification uh, shares of the directors then details on a redeemable preference shares and debentures then remuneration of directors and we have point promoters, minimum subscription for allotment, then date of opening and closing of the issue, information on underwriting commission and brokerage, 
name and address of the company's auditor, secretary, banker, and trustee, particulars of material documents, and forecasted rate of dividend and voting rights. So these are the contents of prospectus. It has been asked for 10 marks. Next concept is remedies for representation in a prospectus. So since prospectus is a really important document because by seeing prospectus people are buying shares in the company. So if a person misrepresents in a prospectus then there is a chance that the person who is buying the share will enter into a fraud. That is why the shareholders or the outsiders are given certain remedies for representation in a prospectus. So there are three remedies, damages for deceit, compensation under section 35 and rescission for mis mis mispresentation. So we will see one by one. Damages for deceit. So prospectors with a fraudulent statement then liable to pay. So if a director or owner of the company makes any fraudulent statement in the prospectors, then they are personally, then the director is personally liable to pay for it. There is a case law, important case law, Derry versus Peak. So, in, under the prospectus, it contains that they are authorized to, to use steam power in moving its trams. So, the prospectus contains that they are authorized to use steam power, but the, it was subjected to fact that the it was subjected to approval of a board of trade. So, if the board of trade allowed only then they could use steam, but they did not include this fact in their prospectus. And later, the board refused to approve that they could use steam power in moving its tram. Even though the uh, board of trade refused, it was held that the company was not liable as there was no fraudulent statement. It contained only factual statements. So since this derivatives peak, they got uh, the company was held not liable. We later got this compensation under section 35. So proper laws were formulated on holding the company liable. So following persons are liable under section 35 if any fraudulent statement is done in a prospectus. The director of the company is directly held liable. Then the, any person who is authorized to be director in a prospectus, then he is also held liable for a fraudulent statement in a prospectus. The next promoters are held liable. Then author, the, any person who is authorized to issue of a prospectus is held liable. Then experts under section 26 clause 5 are held liable under section 35. Exceptions. So when are these persons not held liable under section 35? So there are certain exceptions. First is a director who withdraws his consent before issue of prospectors. So any director who resigns from his post is not held liable. Then prospectors issued without knowledge of director and then he resigned from it and gave public notice, withdraws and gives a public notice. So prospect is issued without the knowledge of the director and when it comes to his knowledge, he withdraws from his consent from the director and with a public notice. Next, ignorant of untrue statement withdraws and a public notice after knowing. So the, the director is ignorant of the untrue statement. Then after knowing, he withdraws with a public notice. Then reasonable ground to believe. So the the director has a reasonable ground to believe that the statement was true. Then also is not held liable. Then untrue statement in a report of expert. So the experts have uh, the experts have given in their uh, report that the untrue statement is correct. Then also the directors are not held liable. Recession for mis misrepresentation. So recession means whenever a shareholder buys his share, so he can lawfully resign from a contract. If he lawfully resign from uh, or, uh, resign from his post, then he is not held liable and the shareholder's money is refunded back. So shareholder can resign lawfully and get a refund under Section 75 Indian Contract Act. But there are certain uh, subjected to certain exceptions when uh, recession does not amount to refund to a shareholder by affirmation. So the shareholder finds that the statement in the prospectus is uh, fraudulent but then also he continues the contract then by affirmation he cannot resign from the contract. He will not be given any compensation. By unreasonable delay. So whenever a shareholder comes to know that the prospectus contains untrue statement then immediately he have to resign from the contract or else uh, due to unreasonable delay he will not get any compensation. The commencement of winding up, of winding up of the company. So if the company is winding up, it is gone bankrupt and it is closing, then also they don't get any compensation. So this concludes unit 2 of the company law.
Thanks for watching.